this, yeah, there we go. Since we're hybrid right now and Kathleen is in hybrid land, uh, there she is. So that's why we're doing it in here rather than how we usually do it. All right, that's fine. That's... So take it away. It's all you. All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Madam Mayor and City Council people and, and city staff. It's always a great opportunity, pleasure to come and talk to you guys, share what we're doing and all the wonderful things that are happening at the Living Desert. Um, beautiful sunset over our, our wonderful campus. Um, Colors are gorgeous up there. I don't know. It should be a video that should start. Uh, we're going to have to do the video at the end. Okay. All right. So we have, we have our third, current 30 second commercial, which shows how wonderful that uh, Living Desert is and all the fun things that people can do. Uh, as you guys know, we have a great educational component to our facility. And so this is a heat map of where our school field trips come from. Uh, and, and it's really surprised us when we started looking at the data that, you know, as far away as Calexico or as far west as Long Beach, our teachers who are putting their kids on a bus or a van and driving them for two or three hours spent on the traffic to come to our facility. Uh, that tells me that we offer a educational experience that's of value to those teachers or they wouldn't be doing that. And of course, I noticed that they're driving past the LA Zoo to come to our facility. So uh, <laughs> a little competition with our friends there. And of course, when I see those yellow school buses out in the parking lot, that tells me that there are hundreds of kids inside the park, many of them having perhaps their first experience seeing wild animals, even the ones that live here in the Southern California, you know, uh, are, are not readily visible. And so this is a chance to, to build those relationships between uh, uh, kids and their uh, natural animals. And we're able to, to expose them to other career opportunities. So in this case, this is at our uh, animal care hospital, one of our vet techs, and I can just see that kid raising his hand. He's thinking, what is my future going to be? Could I take care of animals? Could I have a veterinary as a career? And so it's exposing those to uh, career opportunities to those kinds of kids. And of course, exposing them to all the wonderful animals, whether it's the burrowing screech owl uh, and the other wonderful things that we have here, getting into seeing them up close and personal and enjoying that experience. I wonder who is watching who. Uh, I, sometimes I think the animals get just as much of a kick out of seeing the guests as, as the other way around. And I wish I had this quote, but this is Sylvia Earle, a famous uh, ocean, ocean, oceanographer. You know, if a picture's worth a thousand words, then experience is worth a thousand pictures. And so it's trying to make sure that our guests, uh, kids of all ages, have the opportunity to uh, interact, see the animals, appreciate them for all the wonderful things that they have. Uh, and the second thing we're passionate about is our conservation programs. And so we currently have more than 70 conservation programs in more than 10 different countries around the world. And so this is some places where you either have uh, money that we send to help support uh, conservation activities. We have boots on the ground. I've had six different people in Africa this summer uh, doing different conservation projects. And then we do a lot of remote work, obviously nowadays on providing technical services and skills and abilities to uh, augment conservation projects that are happening. One of our current ones we're doing is the uh, desert tortoise. You know, it's the, uh, um, the uh, rep state reptile for the state of California. Uh, but they are a critically endangered species due to habitat loss and raven predation. And so uh, we are working on an educational component with the area restaurants up in 29 Palms and Yucca Valley to teach them to close their lids of their trash cans. You take away the food, you bring down the raven populations and reduce the predation that happens uh, on those little baby tortoises. And we're approaching from the other end is we are taking hatchlings and we are, we are growing them up to where they are large enough that the ravens can no longer peck through the shells. Uh, and so this is our uh, program there. Nothing cuter than a horde of little baby tortoises munching down on some romaine lettuce. Uh, and the, you might not be aware there's a shortage of romaine lettuce right now. Uh, and the, the crop in California failed. The price is like 400% higher than it was a few months ago. Uh, and so we're having to ration our lettuce and find other things for our tortoises to eat. Uh, one of our other projects we did this last summer was in uh, Africa, in Somaliland. Um, there is a, currently a crisis of cheetahs that are being collected for the wildlife trafficking uh, aspects, and they are being sucked out of Kenya and Tanzania, and they go through Somaliland, so they make it over to the Middle East, where uh, they are kept as uh, status symbol pets. You know, you, you can have your gold-plated Rolls Royce, but unless you have a cheetah in the front seat next to you, you're not cool. And so um, people are selling cheetahs in Africa for 10 bucks or 100 bucks. 
They make their way across the continent, across the Red Sea, and they're being sold for $10,000 in the Middle East, uh, where they live a year, maybe two at the most. Cheetahs are hard to take care of, and then they just buy another one. And so we were able to go to Somaliland, where the Somaliland government is confiscating these animals. There were 90 juvenile cheetahs there, and they needed someone to have cheetah expertise. And so we sent some of our animal care staff and some of our veterinary staff to go there and stabilize the situation, provide some guidance uh, and, and nutritional policies to help us uh, nourish these little guys back up in the state of health. Uh, and, and so you might wonder, you know, you guys have obviously been a supporter of us for many, many years. And in recent years, you've had some grant each year to help us with our operational costs. You might be saying, why should we support the living desert? Uh, and, and well, one is your residents love us. Uh, I think there are 50 some thousand residents in Palm Desert. And so uh, we've sold 42,000 tickets to Palm Desert residents. So I wanna know who are the 10,000 who haven't visited us yet. Um, and those, they make part of what have been over the last 52 years, more than 12 million guests have come through our gates. And so uh, it's, a, it's a great opportunity to uh, share our message with a large number of people. Uh, so I'm gonna thank the city council for their support over the past many years. And in recent years with this operational grant, we certainly appreciate your support and efforts that have helped us. Uh, and I want to thank the, the city staff also for all their efforts to help us on our permitting and things like that. You guys have been a, a great resource to make that smooth and easy. Uh, we did have an opportunity to have a plaque uh, unveiling. Of course, we're in the socially distant six feet. Uh, and if we want to ever come back and redo that again, we're having to wear masks and get more people there. Uh, we'd be glad to, to stage that as a, as a photo opportunity for you guys. Uh, and there's a wonderful plaque. I go out and I, I polish it every morning to make sure it's, it's bright and shiny. Uh, so why do you want to support us? And so uh, we've calculated over the last 10 years, we have generated half a billion dollars in economic impact to the Coachella Valley. Uh, and those are from people who come to the area to see our facility and the money they spend in all the low-income restaurants. So that's jobs, tourist spending, taxes, services, and utilities, uh, all as a result of our operation. So half a billion dollars in 10 years is a pretty big number. And we're, we're proud of that. Um, we had this wonderful ribbon cutting for the for the rhino savanna, which opened up a year ago this month. Um, so we're glad you guys could come and help us be a part of that. Uh, and, and we have this wonderful new rhino savanna. It has been a big hit. It has increased our visitation, increased our conservation messaging for rhinos, uh, and, and was a great uh, resource to add to our facility. This is a video of a rhino wallowing in the mud. Um, and here's a video of a, of a rhino eating a watermelon. Uh, we have our wildlife uh, uh, annual Christmas holiday celebration which we're starting up next Tuesday. It's just around the corner. We are scrambling like mad getting up the last lights in the park. You know, we, we start uh, in the end of September uh, putting up the lights and it takes us quite a bit of effort. Um, but it's a wonderful tradition here in the Coachella Valley and we're, we're glad that we can have uh, that as a community resource to, to come and celebrate the holidays. And we will be doing once again our glow in the park. Uh, this is a, a Chinese lantern festival. We, we tied it last year. It was phenomenally successful. Uh, if those of you had a chance to see it, it just transformed the park with these magnificent LED uh, moving lights. And it, it's, uh, we're a little worried that the Christmas lights won't be fancy enough now that you've seen the, the, the uh, lanterns. Um, but we're going to try it again this coming year from the middle of uh, March through the end of April. And so we think that'll be another big hit for us. Uh, we are currently uh, expanding the park uh, infrastructure. Uh, as we've added more staff, we need more offices. And so we're building a brand new office complex. Uh, it's about a $14 million project that is happening behind the scenes to accommodate the uh, professional staff that we have. And that will enable us to then expand the parking that we have. We're gonna be uh, demolishing our old modular trailers that were uh, uh, had reached the end of their life and we'll expand the parking lot all the way to the south edge of our property uh, where it butts up to the reserve, adding about 230 more public spaces and another 50-ish uh, staff spaces behind the scenes. Uh, so it'll be a great opportunity for us to move more of that overflow residual parking that happens on Portola on those busy nights. We'll be able to come more inside the park. Uh, we are engaged in our Pride of the Desert capital campaign. This is to allow us to finish the next part of our master plan um, uh, which includes building a new uh, restaurant complex for our guests. Uh, our current food facilities were built 
20 or 30 years ago when we only had 200,000 people coming to the park. They are too small, they're out of date. Uh, and, and so the number one question people ask when they leave our park is where can I go to get something to eat? And so we're gonna build a new restaurant complex that will have seating for 150 people uh, in an indoors air conditioned space, which will include our expanded to our shoulder seasons in the summer and will give us another interior space to use for uh, evening rentals. Uh, right now, we don't have anything in the way of interior space except for the Chase boardroom. This will give us a much nicer facility for that. This will open up in the fall of 24, uh, and we are currently in the design work for that right now. We'll be getting it to the city for uh, their preliminary approval and uh, eventually construction documents here in the near future. And then we're working on uh, Lion Ridge. This is the next part of our, our master plan. This is scheduled to open up in the fall of 2025. Uh, it's a two-part. It has a new lion habitat and then a special event conference center. This is what the habitat will look like. Uh, much like the rhino habitat, we will be taking advantage of our wonderful mountain views that we have and all this great scenery. And we'll be orienting the habitat so that you can. Uh, and this is Bighorn Mountain behind the male lion that's up there. So that'll give you an idea of how it's fit within. Uh, and the lion habitat will be three separate components, three separate lion habitats, and we can either let the lions have access to all three of those, or we can ship the animals around as our needs uh, may so dictate whether we have a breeding female and cubs and they need to be isolated from the other guys. This will give us the flexibility to uh, manage them well into the future. Some of the viewing is across the moat, so it's an open, you're just there gazing out at the lions. Uh, on the left is viewing through a, a glass window panel. on. Lions are basically big cats. They weigh 500 pounds, but just like your tabby at home, if it's cool outside, they want to sit in the ray of sunshine. If it's hot outside, they want to sit on the cold tile floor. And so in this case, this rock that both the kids and the lion are adjacent to are temperature controlled rocks. And so they'll be both heated and cooled, and that will give us ability to meet the needs of the animals and we can position them accordingly so that when we want them to be here, we just turn on the heat or the chill and they will migrate there. This is the inside the three animal components. So there is an animal a lion habitat on the left. There's one in the back and there's also one in the foreground. You're literally surrounded by uh, the lion habitats in this location. And then we have what we call a catwalk. Uh, we have to be able to have to move the animals from one habitat to the other. And so there will be an elevated walkway that is enclosed in a protective mesh to keep the lions where they need to be, but it'll be visible to the guest and we can position lions up there. So there could be a male lion up there waiting for you as you're coming in for your event or the first thing in the morning. And then we are building a 500 seat uh, sit down uh, special event uh, conference center. Uh, and you know we have lots of hotel ballrooms here in the Valley, but they are all four beige walls. Uh, this will have a live on, uh, panorama view out into the lion habitat. We think this will be a great resource for the convention and, and uh, visitors that come here. You know, you come here for your week-long conference uh, and you stay at a great resort, but you want to go off-site at least one night uh, and do something that's fun and exciting. We think this uh, will be uh, that opportunity. And then it will have an adjacent uh, outdoor patio component. So we can have your traditional cocktail party as you mingle under the as the sun goes down, you get that golden light up in the mountains. Uh, you meet your friends, you have a drink, and then you'll be able to migrate into the interior space for the, the evening function that's happening there. Uh, the, the, the space is a multifunction. It has a dividable wall, so we can either have it fully open for 500 people, uh, or we can do separate 250 people events at the same time. And this is just a video that showcases the outdoor uh, uh, cocktail party, palm garden space, and then they migrate onto the interior space. So how can Palm Desert help? We'd like to continue our great relationship. Uh, we recognize that you value us as both our educational components to do for your local schools, uh, and the ability we have to engage your residents, and the economic benefit we provide by being part of the local tourism economy. Uh, and so we look forward to continuing that partnership. And of course, we'll be coming back with you with additional proposals about how you can help us even more as the plans for uh, the Lion Ridge and the Events Center continue to develop. So that's my story, things that have happened, lots of great stuff in the past, uh, but we got more great stuff coming up in the near future.
Here we go. I wish I could be a lion in your uh, zoo. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds amazing what you're doing. Uh, the animals and saving the other ones over in Somalia land. It's, uh, Lions have a great conservation story. Uh, people don't realize that they are critically endangered. There's only about 20,000 lions left in the world right now. And within our lifespan, or certainly our kids and grandkids, will be a time that there are no longer free roaming lions in Africa unless we change the trajectory that they're currently on. So we have lion specific conservation programs we do in Africa. And we want to be able to tell people here how they can help uh, us in protecting those animals. And, and Mayor Pro Tem, you said you had a comment. And go on. There we go. So just so you know, this is our second time in this in our council chamber since it's been still working at the boat. Redone. So we're finding our way with you. Uh, Alan, Team Living Desert, good to see you all again. Uh, and thank you for everything you do. I have to share with you that this past weekend we took our uh, five month old grandson to the Living Desert. So you've now enjoyed, I'm going to use <laughs> the word enjoyed, three generations of, of Jonathan's. And what it brought to mind is the changes over it's almost 40 years that we've been going. Um, it was wonderful when our kids were little and, you know, had that resource to go to. But where you are now is incomparable to where we were then. And based on your presentation, incomparable to what it will be in the future. I, I still, every time I get an update, I can't believe the transition, the progress, the amazing things that you're creating over there. So thank you to all of you. And I hope the city continues to support you. I'm sure they will. Well, I like the fact you're bringing your new grandchild here. It's one of the things that I really like is I start hearing these multiple generations. Someone came here as a kid in a high school or in a school program in the 70s, and then they had kids, and now those kids had kids, and you know we're into the third and fourth generation that have enjoyed our facility. And in terms of, you know, we've been making significant investments back into the park. Like any business, if you don't invest back into it, you become stale, out of date, and you no longer provide the experiences the guests are looking for. And so we're working hard to make sure we're always providing a world-class experience that we can uh, provide the, the uh, opportunities for our guests to enjoy our animals in a new and different fashion, whether it's nose to nose with a wallaby or it's uh, you know separated by a piece of relatively thin glass from a, from a 500 pound male lion uh, that they'll be able to enjoy that. And so our master plan is basically continue this uh, basically for now and forever that we're always thinking about how we can improve the park. Uh, and, invest back into it so we have all the infrastructure, whether it's restrooms, gift shops, cafes, and such that we can uh, give our, our guests the, the kind of experience that they're looking for. Are there any other questions or comments? Please. Um, so my, my comment is All right. Well, <laughs> uh, thank you for noticing our, our uh, inclusivity efforts and as we're dying for as the uh, people on the autism spectrum. Uh, and we recently were certified as an autism friendly facility, and we've trained all of our staff on how they can uh, provide services for, for individuals that are uh, uh, in the autism spectrum, because we want to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, and, and that's not only in terms of inclusivity about disabilities, obviously we're ADA compliant and things like that. We also try and be inclusive on the uh, on socioeconomic scale of things. So we offer, uh, you know, we have to make enough money to operate the park. Uh, and so we charge our tourists the full the full rack rate, uh, but we offer a number of, of discounts, some of them very substantial. And so we have a program called Museums for All, where if you have a SNAP or an EBT card, you can get admission to the Living Desert for $3. Uh, and so it's a great opportunity to make sure that we're not uh, uh, excluding uh, segments of our, our control get out of here from that. So I appreciate that, yes. The, the programs you have that you just mentioned are great. I, I want to, as long as you're speaking, we're speaking, I'm seeing Kathleen is having a little issue hearing. So we're going to be guinea pigs for her. Okay. No, we're going to be naked mole rats for her and, and see if we she- We are all on display in one fashion or another. There you go. So 
Kathleen, can you hear from the dais? Can you hear okay? Yes, it was just Councilmember Quintanilla that I could not hear. Okay, and you heard everything from um, Alan? Yes. Okay, all right, thank you. Just want to make sure we got this going. <laughs> we don't mind being the guinea pigs, too. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm oh, sorry, yes, I'm a reliance. And so on... Lions generally have a 50-50 sex ratio when they're born, but under human care, uh, you end up with a surplus of males. So you can have uh, one male with as, number, as many females as you want, but if you put two males with the females, they fight. And so there's a need for organizations to, to keep the surplus males, uh, especially the ones that are genetically valuable. And so, you know, the animals are all managed collaboratively with other zoos in North America. We never take animals from the wild anymore. And so there is a, what's called a species survival plan coordinator. They're the matchmaker. And so they look at the, uh, it used to be on paper notebook. You would know the sire and dam of each animal going back into history. Now it's kind of a combination of ancestry.com and Tinder. Uh, and, and so the, <laughs> the uh, SSP coordinator will make a recommendation that this female needs to go to this organization, to this other zoo, because their genes are underrepresented. And so we put in our request with the SSP coordinator that we're opening this facility in 2025. And so they will bake into their breeding recommendations to, to make sure there are animals available for us. Uh, and so we don't yet qu quite know whether we'll get a, a traditional pride of lions with a male and three to four females or whether we may become the, uh, the repository for the surplus of bachelor males who will live here on, until their number is called and then they get sent off to some other facility to help establish a breeding program there. So that's why we have three different modules to the lion habitat, it gives us the flexibility to manage uh, any combination of uh, sole sex males or a female with, with cubs, or we can just let everybody have the whole run of the place. So why under human care does the gender ratio change? It's not, it's 50-50, it's which is the same oh. as it is in the wild. Okay. In the wild, those surplus males, they fight for access to the females, they get killed off. Um, okay, any other questions or comments? I mean, this is your opportunity too. This is interesting stuff, come on. <laughs> Give me a hard one. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just kidding. Yes, there are. My question is, are there going to be naming rights and, and where do those begin if we would like to have a well, built of course, lion? Of course, you know, we have Jan Hawkins here, our director of development. <laughs> and so we are currently engaged. Our estimate is this is a $60 million capital campaign for the new cafe marketplace, the lion habitats and the special event center. And so we have a whole range from 5,000 up to as high as you want uh, to and as many zeros as you want uh, with naming opportunities to, to go along with those. So you can, uh, if you can put us in with Leo DiCaprio, he can have the, it can be the Leo DiCaprio Lion Ridge Habitat of the Living Desert uh, down to, well, we'll be talking to, uh, you know, just regular people who want to uh, symbolically adopt an animal for $100 and the $100 will go to help uh, support our capital campaign. And Perfect we, of course, Christmas are having... Perfect Christmas present. What's that? Perfect Christmas present. Uh -huh. Adopt an animal. It's, it's a great experience. You get a, to support the animals. You get a little uh, plush animal and some uh, information about the uh, conservation status and the, the care of these. Uh, so we had our first kickoff on uh, event last night uh, to uh, invite people to the park, we'll wine and dine them, give them a little show and tell, and let them know how they can help us. And we'll be doing those uh, probably every week for the next three years. <laughs> <laughs> Hawkins is busy. <laughs> oh, no, I, Kathleen, please, thank you. Uh, this is really just a curiosity. Um, what you're planning by way of a event venue for conventions or just local people? Uh, want to book a very special dinner. It's really quite exciting. Uh, and I know you have some outdoor events now with music. It piqued my curiosity as to how that outdoor music affects the animals. 
So we have a whole uh, operational policy to make sure that we aren't providing additional stress for our animals. And so for instance, we never have fireworks on our property at least. Uh, and we have a decibel level that we maintain uh, no more than 75 decibels. Uh, and so there can be a little bass beat going on, but there's not gonna be any kind of loud rock and roll that will uh, stress the animals out. Um, uh, so we're always looking for the best interest and welfare of, of the animals in terms of the events that we held in the park. Thank you. It just uh, uh, reminded me of one of the issues that I know we've dealt with in the past and I hope we'll continue to be proactive with, and that's, um, you know, traffic. Uh, Portola being a two-lane street mm -hmm. is, can hardly handle the kind of volume that hopefully uh, you'll enjoy. And so uh, like Coachella and Stagecoach, hopefully there'll be systems of buses or shuttles that'll be able to take people there and won't put a stress on parking or on the street uh, itself. And uh, not just the animals that you watch over, but the human animals that reside all around you. Yes, our neighbors across the street and such, we're, we're very aware of the impacts that we sometimes have when uh, there are traffic jams on Portola. So we've instituted a couple of things. Uh, and, uh, with the start of the pandemic, we instituted uh, time ticketing entry. And so this enables us to control, uh, not completely, because some people just show up, uh, and, but there's, there are time tickets. You can arrive at seven o'clock and we'll let you in the park. Uh, and that's helped us to spread out the visitation uh, so there's not a, a peak arrival at Sector Thock when, when we first open up. Uh, we've also worked with the city and the Riverside County Sheriff's Department so that there are uh, both highway signs at the key intersections, uh, warning the residents what's coming, and then telling the, the guests who might not be familiar that, you know, take the next left and things like that. Uh, and then we have sheriff's deputies available to help us with some traffic control uh, at the key intersections and such that we can work to, to manage that. And we've recently, just as of yesterday, installed a new sidewalk on Portola, going from our entrance uh, south to the reserve, so that people that can either walk down from the reserve or Ironwood, or people that park on the street on that side, don't have to walk in the street to come to our facility. They can walk on a sidewalk and, and come into our, into our park. Any other questions or thoughts? Please. I have a question. Um, a question that I saw was in terms of the species conservation. Uh, you listed the desert willow, so that's a surprise that one of our, our native trees is on there. So if you can let us know how the city can support that. And also, will you be resuming the early entry for members? And we, we have a whole uh, grant program that we've worked with to help us with uh, pollinator gardens throughout the Coachella Valley and some other horticulture activities to encourage the, the planting of uh, desert adapted species rather than bringing in all the exotics that require uh, just tons of water. Uh, and so we're always working to not only uh, educate our guests about the, the warm and fuzzy animals, but also the other uh, species of plants and such that are desert appropriate. And, Right now, there are not plans to change our uh, operating hours uh, and allow the early entry for members. Uh, and after some careful review, we decided that, that was a, a security safety risk that uh, did not make sense for us operationally. Uh, and it made more sense to go ahead and let visitors in uh, in, a, in a single time opportunity. Uh, okay, any other thoughts? Or questions? I can't imagine that, I mean, the city manager doesn't want to know about a rhino or anything, but okay. <laughs> I, get, I get personal tutorage every quarter. <laughs> Great. Yes, I appreciate the opportunity to, to come and share and, and uh, have my staff meet your staff and uh, coordinate uh, marketing and other uh, citywide issues that have uh, been important to us. Well, I know just as... Um, Sabi said, I, those of us who've been here for so long appreciate so much that the, that, uh, the living desert gives, and it's such an asset to this city and, in fact, to the valley. So thank you for all you do. Well, I appreciate that. And we've been blessed to have uh, not only support of the local city governments, but obviously the, the residents here in the Coachella Valley that come and visit us in increasing numbers every year because uh, they enjoy what we have to offer. Well, thank you. All right. Appreciate the time. Thank you, guys. Thank you. So we have a, a 2.30 closed session. So I think everybody probably needs, what time is it? 2.30. So why don't we all take a quick break?
Madam Mayor. Yes, uh, sir. We do have an urgency item we would like the city council to consider. Uh, yes. The matter came to the attention or the matter, the need for the discussion came to the attention after the posting of the agenda. And there's a need to take uh, or at least receive direction uh, immediately. Uh, the issue is property description 1.55 acres at southeast corner of Fred Waring Drive and San Pablo Dr um, Avenue. Okay. Uh, agency, City of Palm Desert, City Negotiator, Ted Heilman and Eric Seha. Negotiating parties, Chandi Enterprises, LLC, and under negotiation is price and terms. And do we need a, um, well, I think we probably need to open the, I didn't open the meeting. I guess I need to open the meeting. Then we'll have to call for a four-fifths vote to add that to the agenda. Okay, so, and then we'll take a break. Okay, <laughs> so I'll, I'll call to order the Palm Desert City Council successor agency to the Palm Desert Redevelopment Agency and Housing Authority meeting uh, held in a hybrid fashion for November 17th, 2022 to order. And we do have a closed session and we were just notified of the need to add something to the agenda. Uh, you've heard what that is. Can we have a motion to add that? So moved. I second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I think we need a roll call vote, please. Mayor Pro Tem Jonathan. Aye. Councilmember Kelly. Yes. Councilmember Nistandi. Yes. Councilmember Itania. Aye. Mayor Harnick. Yes. Motion passes five to zero. Thank you. So we will now take a let's see if we can do it five to seven minutes and then we'll we'll be in closed session. Thank you. 